Good morning everyone. My name is uh, Leanne Hyde. I'm a professor of clinical psychology from the University of Queensland and the Queensland representative on the Australian Psych Professional Society of Alcohol and Drugs or APSA Council. Um, today we have a, a really exciting event um, that APSAD's co-hosting with Insight and Quinata. We have Professor Renat Weirs here presenting. But first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today and pay respect to elders past, present and emerging and extend our respect to Aboriginal and all Torres Strait Islanders who are joining us here in the room as well as online. So Professor Renat Weirs is from the University of... Is it Amsterdam? <laughs> he's a professor of developmental psychopathology um, and he's in, this, in works in the Faculty of Social Sciences. Um, he's got a background in experimental psychology and recently completed his clinical training in psychology as well. So he's also got quite a bit of professional experience. He's renowned for his work on um, understanding the neurocognitive processes involved in the etiology of addiction. Um, particularly his work on implicit cognitive process and attention bias training that he's going to be presenting today. So please join me in welcoming Renat for his presentation today. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you for inviting me and it's really exciting uh, for me to be here today and talk to you but also to you. And I know one of you. It's a different story. Um, all right. This is uh, uh, the title on the use of targeted cognitive training in the treatment of substance use disorders. And basically my plan is to give you some background and the current state of affairs, at least from my perspective. Um, so here's the little outline. I'll first introduce cognitive biases for a little bit. Then the big chunk is going to be, can we change these biases and what are the effects in addiction? I'll make a little comparison with current medications for addictions and then outline some of the uh, next step we and colleagues are struggling with. Alright, so cognitive bias is an addiction. Basically it's like a collection of different patterns of information processing which are biased and then depending on which cognitive process you target it can be an attentional bias, it can be a memory association bias or it can be biased action tendencies. And this might so sound a little bit abstract, but I'll show you later on how we assess and also change all these things. Um, so already in a lot of research, we and others have shown that when you assess these biases, you have like unique extra predictive validity on top of using questionnaires. So it's not the same thing. And it's also not if you take these more task related uh, variables that you don't need the questionnaires anymore. They're really complementary, but you explain more variance, so more differences in outcomes, for example, if you do both. All right, so of course that's not the whole story with addiction. There's also other things going on, for example, uh, there's relatively weak executive control functions and there's much debate about the question to what extent this is a precursor, a consequence of drug use um, or maybe even there's some evidence that it might be most strongly related to detoxifications. It's also clinically very relevant so if somebody really doesn't want to change it's probably better to not detox because you do more harm than good if you do detox and then they return to drinking. Um, we did a review a couple of years ago and found the strongest evidence really in the etiological pathway rather than the consequence pathway. Um, it's not that people are just distracted by drug related uh, cues, which is the drug related attentional bias. It might be a more general thing, and this is ongoing collaborative work with the group of Mike Lepelli, who is at UNSW, um, and Lucio Batella, who's now, who was there and is now at Monash, where uh, the idea is to study to what extent people are distracted by signals of reward in general. So it can be, you know, you have these setups where you have to look for, say, one 
Q in gray while ignoring the others and then there's this big red or blue distractor. If you look at that one, you always lose. So you, you don't want to do that, but you want to ignore it. The interesting thing is to say if red signals more reward, if you don't look at it, you're going to still be more distracted by it. So it's neat paradigms and we're starting to relate that now to addiction. So it could be a more general pattern. And in this first study published last year, we could show that that is already related to drug use in students. And now we're also looking at this in uh, addicted populations. Other stuff, also very clinically relevant, suboptimal self-insight. And that is already relevant at the student level where um, if we recruit people for help with their alcohol problems, there's big silence, even though if we do the screeners, we have really have very heavy drinking students. And of course, with a lot of further down um, the trajectory, people with addiction, it can be even worse. And there's different aspects here, and it's relevant. So there's really a lot of things going on. Big question is, of course, so we know there's big differences between people with an addiction and without. Um, big question is to what extent the precursor, but also to what extent can it reverse once you have the, uh, you know, once you detox and stay abstinent, or can it be reversed further with training? I should also notice that these biases that we found, for example, approach bias, but also attentional bias, they're really relative. So often people take them as if you know, there's no control whatsoever when there's a drug use. That's not true. So what we show is that, for example, most people with an alcohol problem or cannabis problem, recent paper in addiction with gambling, the same thing. Over all trials, we find they have an easier time approaching drug stimuli than avoiding them. But not everyone and definitely not on every trial. So it is a relative difference. That's, I think, important also for interpretation. And as already mentioned, the big question is really, to what extent can you remediate these differences? But of course, if you don't know to what extent the difference was there in the first place, sometimes remediation might be a misnomer. So for example, if you have people, you know, some patients with say an alcohol problem, they score lower on average on working memory than the average, and then you do training and abstinence and they're getting like halfway. So in a typical paper this will be called partial remediation. But we don't know. It might be full remediation of whatever level that person has normally. Because we have no starting value. And this is actually, this whole thing as a brief aside, it's just to flag it if you find this interesting. There's this big discussion on the question to what extent addiction should be seen as a brain disease. So the standard model from the US, say the NIDA model, is that addiction is a chronic relapsing brain disease. Um, and Alan Leshner, that's the former president of uh, NIDA, stated so in a paper in Science, current director Nora Volkov states it in follow-up papers. But there's a lot of discussion about this because Actually, if you look at it at the um, epidemiological level, most people with an addiction at some point in their la life quit without professional help. And, you know, at least some people even like, you know, you, there's cases where somebody has been a heavy smoker for 25 years and suddenly you change your perspective and they successfully quit. It's rare, but it does exist. Whereas with other brain diseases, it's, you know, if somebody has dementia, typically not over the weekend that you decide to not forget anything anymore. So there seems to be some difference. <coughs> um, and also again, coming to this point that it is relative, that even severe addicts, and this is interesting research by Carl Hart, um, he gave them choices between the monetary equivalent of their preferred drug and the drug. They take the money on most of the cases. So it's not like, you know, and that was the original proposed model, like once you are addicted, there's just no choice anymore. 
I think there's like a relative degrading of choice and then the interesting question is to what extent does it get back and this is a paper I did on the question with my neighbor who's uh, in the Netherlands who's a student of philosophy at UCL so I felt entitled to talk finally on free will um, and how that might be relatively degraded but I th really think the interesting question is to what extent does it get back but of course there's all issues about what free will is and recently there was this um, European launch of the Addiction Theory Network and it's really a position paper. So all of the authors have their own little piece. Most of them fiercely oppose the disease model of addiction. My position is that it's now often presented, especially in America, as this is the scientific state of affairs, whereas it's a hypothesis. There's really no strong evidence at this moment it might be true for some functions that they really uh, degrade um, and don't return or are not retrainable and to the extent that that actually makes people relapse I think it makes sense to talk about a brain disease but there's not a lot of data supporting that position so I think it's really an empirical question and it shouldn't be presented as the current state of affairs if you're interested in this also to the viewers at home because you like watching things. There's also a debate in Amsterdam earlier this year between probably one of the most uh, outspoken opponents, it's Mark Lewis, who's also in this paper, and Nora Volkov in Amsterdam and a panel including me um, on the brain disease perspective. And interestingly they had an opening statement and there Nora Volkov talked about a brain disease but she actually backed away a little bit of the chronic part and that is interesting because if it, I mean clearly somebody who has an addiction now the brain is not functioning optimally there's no question there the interesting question is to what extent do we return to say normal levels or not so as long as it's not chronic I don't have any problem with it but that's still the dominant vision if you go to the NIDA websites. Okay, touching the wrong key here. So that's a bit of background. Now let's see what we can do with training. Yeah, this is like one of those figures I often made for students and then I was asked to do a commentary in biological psychiatry, cognitive neuroscience a couple of months ago on a paper on working memory training. I thought this is actually nice to put that figure in that I always have to draw for students because now it's a published figure. So basically what I'm uh, arguing is there's two types of training that we should distinguish and they're often confused in the literature so that's why I think this is somewhat handy to have a taxonomy. And it's very simple to distinguish the two and that is are we training a general function so for example working memory inhibition, self-control, mindfulness, something like a general skill and because it's general there are no cues of the addiction right so it can be the exact same thing for somebody with cocaine or for alcohol or smoking general training or we do some form of training where we do have the cues and then of course it becomes very important to get the right cues that family of training paradigms are called cognitive bias modification. So depending on which of these processes you target, attention, memory, action tendencies, you get different varieties. Now by and large, uh, I think there's a wide consensus now that it's possible to do working memory training, increase working memory capacity in healthy volunteers, but actually also in people with different disorders and a lot of this was done in children with ADHD for example however the problem is they basically only trained and get better at that task it doesn't really generalize to their everyday problems so that is a problem because the primary purpose was not to make them better in that task but to make them do better in life right um, so that is really the main issue generalization so of course one of the things we and others are now looking at is maybe we should just add some of the addiction cues 
but then we're moving to the other side. Okay? All right, so a little overview of the two branches. Most of it will be about cognitive bias modification, but a little bit on uh, training general abilities. As I mentioned, a lot of positive results in children with ADHD, however, problems with generalization. Question is, may this help in addiction? Keep on pushing that button. Um, so as you see, there's no alcohol cues or anything. You just get like patterns like this and uh, you have to tap that. So this was a study with heavy drinkers who wanted to change online because also working memory training t takes tons of sessions like 25 sessions or so so uh, this is a former phd student and a postdoc katrijn halben uh, so the first question is can we train working memory answer is yes so you follow how well somebody does and you get their working memory up control group always gets patterns of three so basically they have a 100% success rate. So if the whole training effect would be positive reinforcement, applause, this would be the winning group. Because here of course you make mistakes, that's why you get the level. Okay, but there is increase, so you're really training. Uh, here you see at the end, but also at follow up, that it does make a difference, whether you train or just get applause. So that's good. Question is, of course, does it help these people to reduce their drinking? The answer is one of the yes no's. So, there's an overall small effect. So, here is the training condition. As you see, they reduce where only a plus is not going to make any difference. Um, it actually gets, interestingly, it gets significant once you get their automatic positive associations with alcohol into the equation. So, that means that those people with strong positive associations, which probably are a driving force in the drinking, as we showed in other work, that they really profit from increasing their capacity to control, which of course makes sense. But if they are not really driven by more automatic preferences, it doesn't make any difference whether they increase their working memory or not. So I think it does make sense. Um, Warren Bickle in the US has done uh, probably the most of the working memory training work. In the first study he found reduced delay discounting in stimulant addiction. Uh, no effect was mentioned on the addiction, so probably it wasn't there. I'm sure he didn't forget to look at it. Um, and in this recent study where they looked at uh, people with alcoholism, um, so that's the one I commented on, so it's in the same issue. Uh, they found increased working memory and interestingly generalization to future episodic thinking and that especially with those people with a low working memory to start with so this is a group with addiction if they have low working memory they'll also be bad in future episodic thinking and of course that is therapeutically a bit of an issue because this is about okay once i'm out how am i gonna uh, fix my issues with the rent, how am I going to find a job and make concrete plans, see yourself in that situation. So this is therapeutically actually very relevant. So if the, you can increase them there and add the regular therapy, that might actually be helpful. Um, and there's also work, there's a nice review by Marsha Bates on natural recovery but also trained recovery it's a bit old but the general point is still good that also giving the feedback about the progress and especially if you link it to the therapeutic process might be helpful and we also know now how to target people for this general ability stuff those people with low working memory to start with so there's some hope there um, i think especially in a clinical context where you can really add it to regular therapy so now we go to the other branch and first of all sketch a little bit the background because that's really important if you want to appreciate the current state of affairs. So as I mentioned in the introduction, 
different cognitive biases have been related to addiction but actually to a lot of psychopathology also anxiety health problems etc and already in the 90s there were tons of cross-sectional studies so if you take heavy drinkers light drinkers the heavy drinkers show more of an attentional bias um, but the question is of course does it play a causal role it could just be you know some epiphenomenon or something and there's you can do any correlational study but it's never going to tell you you can always make up some story why you could find the effect without a causal effect so there's only one royal road to finding what is a causal effect let's do an experiment and here oh well there western australia colin mcleod was the first to kind of switch things around like this he works mostly in anxiety we do some collaborative work uh, also on addictions um, so he actually originally in the 1980s already uh, designed one of the most used attentional bias tasks the visual probe or dot probe task I'll show you in a bit and then um, the idea is if we change this task from assessment to manipulation will we get some effect in the relevant behavior okay I'll just make it more concrete first and then I'll show you so the, here it's translate this is not threat but alcohol of course so you will get a task like this as you see one of the pictures can be alcohol the other is not alcohol and then what the participant does is we basically indicate do you see one or two pixels um, in the place of one of the pictures and what you see by and large if you do many trials is that if you're a heavier drinker you're going to be faster in a trial like this where the dots replace the alcohol than in trials where the dots replace the non-alcohol right and actually if you do eye movements you see why that is because they're looking at the alcohol and then the dot is on the other side so they have to go all the way to the other side it takes approximately 30 milliseconds but you get this difference but again many trials in terms of reliability this is probably the worst possible task so if you want to determine if one individual has an attentional bias you might as well throw a cone it's really terrible in terms of reliability very close to zero would not pass any test of individual difference I'll get back to that later however a nice thing is of course if you do this assessment variety of the task half of the time alcohol is on the left half on the right but also these dots are half of the time behind the alcohol and half of the time behind the non-alcohol right because you want to see the difference in reaction times but there's no laws prescribing you have to do it like that so the flash of mind was if you change this what would happen so if you do most of the dots after a while after the alcohol what would happen or behind the non-alcohol so as I mentioned Colin did this for the first time in anxiety so he took like medium level anxious students not very anxious people and they all start with 50 50 the dots behind the threat signals or non-threat and then by random allocation you show what's the difference if you have most of the dots behind the threat or behind the non-threat and guess what in the next experiment they thought but it was solving insolvable anagrams so they get and they're told it's very simple so they get real stressed especially those who were trained toward the threat so you get a short-lived effect on threat stress sensitivity and that's how you show a causal effect that's not a therapy I mean for one thing half of them are trained to become more stressed of course you would never do that in the therapy right so that's important um, so of course with alcohol same thing you can either take not too heavy drinkers do split design see if it changes their craving their beer drinking right after as I'll show you in a bit or um, you do 50-50 if you also include real heavy drinkers and that's what we did in this study 
It's the first proof of principle study is heavy drinking students. So after some discussion with the ethical committee um, and they looked also at the threat results, they said, well, maybe not such a good idea to train them further to alcohol. So we have one group, they all start with 50-50 and then one group is trained away from alcohol and the other keeps on doing the 50-50. What did we find? So this is this difference called the attentional bias. Uh, what you see is a small attentional bias in this control group who keeps on doing the assessment. Uh, but a negative bias, so that actually means they're now trained to f attend to the non-alcohol in the experimental group. So this is actually good. But you also see that there are actually two bars. So these are the trained pictures and these are new pictures, untrained pictures. So what you see is the effect is big in the trained pictures, but yeah, that's not very relevant. What you want is generalization, at least, to novel pictures, right? And there is something there, but it wasn't significant. But it's going in the right direction. So if this were a medication study, I would say, okay, clearly there seems to be something there, let's increase the dose, right? Um, so, many people, most of these studies, were done either by Matt Field and his group or uh, by us, um, showed by and large this pattern of results. So you can change the attentional bias, but in a single session with students, it doesn't really generalize. Sometimes it does a little bit, but no strong findings. But the question is, what would happen if you do multiple sessions? So this was our first small clinical trial. Um, so these are patients most of them outpatients, some inpatients, who do five sessions of attentional retraining with new alcohol pictures every time to foster generalization um, on top of their regular treatment. And that's also an important thing to keep in mind. So we have the attentional retraining group and we have the controls. Some people think this is just Q exposure, so that's why often uh, you keep the exact same stimuli in the control group. So you either do 50-50. In this case, we just put the pictures in a different task, a memory categorization task where they sorted it with even and odd numbers, so completely irrelevant. But they did see the same thing and got the same motivating feedback. You're getting better, you're getting faster, etc. Everyone wins prizes. And then the question is, of course, what happens with this attentional bias? So what we see in the control group, it actually goes up. And I wasn't sure because this is a small study and we have this control group who also see the pictures, how relevant this would be. But there's actually, it's a pattern that re-emerges. And also, if you don't do anything, you see that on average, people who are treated have an increase in attentional bias. And that's actually predicted of, predictive of relapse. So it's kind of interesting. You talk about, you know, you do therapy, um, how they want to change their life and how alcohol has been bad, etc. Meanwhile, they get like an incubation effect, if I talk with biologists, um, which is predictive of relapse. So not good. Fortunately, we can now do something about it because the, com the experimental group gets a negative attentional bias, and this is for untrained pictures. So there is generalization within the task. That's a nice first step. So even untrained pictures, they have now been trained to first attend the uh, non-alcohol. And that actually had some promising clinical effects. So significant effect, but again, it's a very small study. However, the last study of this series of training studies that I'll show you is a very big study with over a thousand patients and we get the exact same pattern. So an increase in the control group and a decrease um, in the attentional group. So that seems like that's why I'm pretty confident at the pattern either and this is a uh, small study. Also interesting is from more like underlying mechanisms perspective, 
The whole effect is AB 500, that means 500 milliseconds of stimulus presentation. And for more basic neuroscience, we know this is like interesting interplay between bottom-up effects and top-down effects. So it's really where you can start changing something. Nothing goes on at 150 milliseconds. And that also seems to be a general pattern across different tasks. So the very first attentional engagement, like the one with this other uh, general task, the VMAC, and also in a task with very rapid serial presentations, uh, like you see pi different pictures for only 100 milliseconds, then the first and second leg, they're almost impossible to uh, change. Even if you pay people $100, to uh, not be affected by an erotic picture, for example, uh, that's right before your target, they're going to be affected. So it's this a little. We need a little bit more time to adjust these responses. That's apparently what it seems to be doing. But that's a different thing than what you get through regular CBT, because all of this again is on top of CBT. But as you see here, this is a first indication, but also in the larger studies, it does help a subgroup of people to remain abstinent. Um, okay, so now we, we have had attentional bias, now we go to approach bias. So, same logic, first show you how we assess it, and then can we change it in students, and if we can, can we change it in patients, and does it have an effect? So here's our assessment tool. As you see, we use a joystick. It's a task uh, developed with Mike Rink from Nijmegen, and uh, we do all of the training work together also. Where um, there's a, um, the picture comes in either landscape or portrait, so it's an irrelevant fe feature paradigm. That means that the participant has to react to the format of the picture. For example, no matter what's on the picture, if it's in landscape, you're going to push the joystick. If it's in portrait, you pull. Right? So we start with gray boxes, and after a while, everyone knows what the idea is, right? Then we put in the alcohol, and general positive, general negative. And this is an important feature of the task, that if you, joy if you pull the joystick toward you, it has this zoom effect. So that's important because now we're all on the same page that this is approach, so my body is the reference point, and it's not the beer. Because otherwise, like, 20% of people take this as approach, and of course it messes up the whole measurement. So obviously this is what happens if you push the joystick. So what do we find? Assessment, heavy drinking students, guess what? Heavy drinking students are faster to pull alcohol pictures. And it's specific for alcohol, so we don't find it for general positive pictures, not for general negative pictures. It's all flat lines, but hey, alcohol. So that's the automatically triggered action tendency. As you see, it's also moderated by a gene. This is the OPRM1 gene, so the mu opiate receptor. And if you have a G allele, as about one out of five people here have, um, then you're real good in pulling beer. And actually also some of the control pictures where we had soft drinks and ketchup and the same gene has also been related to obesity. So it might be related to a general strong appetitive drive. Um, it's also related to Q-induced craving, as we and others have shown. So, same logic. We can assess this bias, biased action tendencies. Can we change it and what happens? So this was one of those student studies. In this study, we took like a mid-range of drinkers for students, audit between eight and 15, I think. So not very light drinkers, but also not the problem drinkers because we wanted to do this split design. And um, so they all come we actually recruited them with posters of beer under it 
do you taste the difference? So it was very easy to recruit enough participants. But it was also important because they know they were gonna get some beer tests, but first we had to do the reaction time test. And the reaction time test was this one. So they start with equally often pushing and pulling pictures. But now the nice thing is, because they react to the format, that one group gets at some point most of the alcohol pictures in the push format, and the other gets most of them in the pull format. And guess what happens? Strong effects for a single session in unmotivated students. So we get a generalization to a different memory task, I'll show you in a bit. Um, but also to beer drinking right after. So those people who are on the heavier side of drinking, but not real strong problem drinkers, but they have been trained toward the alcohol pictures. They drink almost all of the three beers in the next 10 minutes for taste test. Well, of course you only need to taste one sip of each, fill out the form. The light drinkers, it doesn't make any difference, but in the heavy drinkers who are trained away, they suddenly behave like light drinkers and do a little sip, fill out the questionnaires. So that was quite striking. Also, they weren't aware at all, and that's typically what we find if we start with 50-50 in a single session and change to 90-10, people are just not aware. But it does affect their behavior. So that was cool, and then we said, well, we should definitely try this out in patients. By then, we started this collaboration with a nice clinic in Germany, the Lindo Clinic. Johannes Lindemeyer, he's the director. Real big, so as you will see in the next studies, the numbers really go up. This is still a small study with over 200 um, alcohol dependent patients. The last one will be 1400. Um, but we knew it was big already, so what we did here is have two training conditions because we wanted to find out does it make any difference if we explain to people they need to push alcohol pictures away or if they react to the format of the picture and push alcohol pictures away. So they do the same thing. Instruction differs. The answer was no, so we just put them together. And then we also have both the 50-50 assessment control and people doing nothing because we wanted to kind of reassure that it wouldn't have any effect to see all these pictures. And it didn't. So what were the outcomes? This is this strong generalization. We already found some of that in the students, but here after four sessions of training, new pictures every session, on top of regular treatment, important to uh, remember, is <coughs> you find an effect in this task implicit association task with words. So in this task, the, there's a word coming up in the middle. So it can be beer, for example, then you press left in this phase, or it can be coke, you press right, and it can be an approach word toward or avoid word away. Okay? And we have the other sorting condition where alcohol is with the avoid words and soft drinks are with the approach words. Now again, a bit like the attentional bias, what you see at pretest is that on average, they find this one way easier than this one. And these were real heavy alcohol dependent patients. On average, they had had a problem for over 12 years, several previous detoxes, and um, also issues with work, which it's like the general reason for referral there. So if you talk with them, it's not like alcohol is this great rosy thing. No, it ruined their lives and their relationships, their health. So they're very much aware alcohol is bad. But look at their automatic pilot. Alcohol approach. If we only talk about it, it's not going to change. But if we train, it does change to the other side. So now the first association is alcohol avoid. So this is two experimental clinical psychologists is like the coolest finding ever because you go from pictures to words. But you might think, you know, cool, what do you have these two tasks? What does it mean in real life? Well, this does. This is what it means in real life. The nice thing of this clinic is that one year after treatment discharge, they always do a follow-up. 
So we didn't even have to organize this. They already do it. We just get the data in. And if we link that to the training group, we see that adding this targeted cognitive training to regular treatment adds 13% of less relapse. So that's real nice. On average, this is pretty normal. A bit more than 50% relapse a year after treatment discharge. We get it down to almost 40% in this time. So it's simple because they do the regular CBT for three months, the whole program. They just add a little bit of training, four sessions, 30 minutes. I mean, there's still people relapse, it's not like the problem is solved. But at least for a subgroup, it seems to make a difference. And it's not a one trick pony. Um, here we did 500. Uh, patients and we also wanted to know like individual differences in how many sessions people need so in this case we did 12 sessions later on in the treatment trajectory so we could also study the learning curves um, and we could study mediation and moderation and we found it so 9% less relapse a year later a little bit less which might be surprising because on average they have more sessions. I'll get back to that later. It might be because it's later in the treatment process. Um, but also nice is that this training effect is partially mediated by this change in approach bias, which is of course what you want to see. And also you see this moderating effect that it helps especially those people with a strong approach bias to begin with. So that's reminiscent of the working memory training. If you have low working memory, go working memory training. If you have a strong approach bias, go approach bias training. But the working memory, you can easily assess on an individual level with a reliable test. But this, with these implicit tests where you react to something else, picks up lots of noise, is not as terrible as the dot probe, but it's pretty bad. So we get a reliability of these 0 0.3, 0 0.4, so still not very good to make individual diff, uh, decisions, so the best seems to be to simply train everyone. I mean, if you do three months of training, a couple of sessions of half hour uh, to be added, where it helps about half the people, not bad, right? So the nice thing is, um, it's not only in this German clinic, but it also works in Australia, at least in Melbourne. Uh, so we have people from Turning Point who did a first trial. So it's a small study, but interestingly, the, interestingly, they did it during detox, and they get big effects. So you see, there's 22% difference between the people who were trained or placebo training, which is bigger than the 13% and 9% we got, but it's a really small sample. So. Of course, what needs to be done is a study where you do a randomization and then get it either during detox, directly after when we had 13%, or even later in the process when we had 9%. But the trend seems to be earlier, bigger effects. But it's different studies, so you can't really directly compare it. Then, what does it do to the brain? Can we really call this brain training? And some people find that very, very important. Um, as you see, suddenly there's a different first name here. Uh, and this is the story of my far cousin. Um, so one day when I was still working in Maastricht, I got this uh, email from somebody working in this field. Actually, the person who showed that the detoxes are really bad for your brain, Dora Duca. Um, asking me if my last name was very common and I could honestly say it's not it's from the north of the Netherlands small family etc because she said you know there's this student and of all things she wants to do addiction research I said well that's weird anyway later on I went to Amsterdam she came over we met and she went on to do a PhD in Berlin on neuroimaging of addictions really good center there that's in Berlin, that's actually close to that clinic where we're working with. So we started a collaboration where she got patients from the clinic before they do the training or sham training, scan them, 
and then again after the training. And if you do brain training and get effects, you get to American Journal of Psychiatry. It's kind of ironic because our first training study we had also sent to American Journal of Psychiatry and there was this one psychiatrist who said, yeah, well, this all looks very nice, but it's too good to be true. And we don't have brain effects. Okay. Of course, this is a very small study because it's very expensive. You have to get them all to the scanner. So around 40, 30 uh, patients, 32. Um, and we get nice brain results, as I'll sh show you in a bit. But then they said, yeah, but we actually were very interested, but we also want to see the clinical results. I said, well, <laughs> you had them, <laughs> but you need maybe a bit more people for them. But you had them. Okay. Um, so what do we see in the brain? Um, a pretest, strong amygdala reactivity to the alcohol cues in the scanner. And if you do the training, that reduces. If you get to see the same pictures, so again, it's not curative, Q exposure, um, because they do see the exact same pictures in the placebo condition, there's no change, no significant change. And ingeniously, she also got the approach bias in the scanner. So with a metal-free uh, joystick, to my surprise, I didn't even expect it in this setting with this small group, given the reliability issues, but she did get the approach bias at pretest, and it was reduced in the training group. And that was related with the medial prefrontal cortex and also with reductions in craving. So we have some idea what it does in the brain. And this also points to, again, like who might this work for? People which show a strong curativity and strong approach bias. So now, the latest data, as I already alluded to in press just a week or two, where we have 1400 patients and now we have a 2x2 two two design. So that means they either get this approach bias training with the joystick, or they get attentional training as you saw in the beginning, or a bit of both. We wanted to keep the number of sessions the same. So everyone gets six sessions, six sessions approach bias, six sessions attentional bias training, or three of each, or every corresponding placebo condition, or nothing at all. And what do we see? After a year, again, clear effects of training reducing the relapse compared with either placebo or nothing at all. Doesn't make any difference. So there's no differences between the two control conditions and no differences between all of the training conditions statistically. If anything, attentional here seems to do best and we would have put our bets on the combined training because we also have data showing they're, they're slightly different. However, as I mentioned, they did three sessions of each only. Meanwhile, we found out that there's a lot of individual difference in how many sessions people need and the median was six. So probably three is just too little for most of the people. So again, replicated training effects on clinical outcome one year follow up. It's somewhat specific, so you get a stronger reduction in the approach bias than in control training. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we get a significant lower increase in attentional bias in attentional training than if you don't do anything. So that seems to be the default it gets up and specific effects so approach bias training doesn't train the attentional bias and vice versa. We didn't get mediation effects and that's probably because of measurement issues. I already mentioned the poor reliability. Also we lost tons of data uh, and that's because of uh, data policies, privacy policies in the clinic that every night all the data is wiped out. So if the research assistant was not there or forgot to get it from the computer, it's not there. So replicated beneficial effects. As already mentioned, probably too short for the three plus three. So if I will put my money on something, it will be six plus six of this version of the training. So is CBM effective to treat addiction? Um, 
well, after the studies you've seen, and uh, that was the feeling we had, we thought, well, it must be. But then there was this meta-analysis saying the relationship between cognitive bias and addiction was not significant. Our results cast serious doubts on the clinical utility of CBM interventions for addiction problems. How can this be? Well, this is what happens if you put together apples and oranges. So, um, it was published in PLOS One, where you can do commentaries. Uh, so there's a commentary of Matt Field, one of myself. And we have this paper which will come out later this month, uh, where we look at all the studies and say well, you should really distinguish between experimental lab studies, so the student studies, and clinical trials, because they're really different in many respects. And then we can assess what's going on. So why are they so different? And I already introduced a little bit. Well, they're really different in many planes. So the experimental lab studies, as I mentioned, they're aimed, their aim is to establish causality. So that's why you could also increase attentional bias or approach bias to see if it increases drinking. Um, who are participating students? They're typically not even aware that there is an intervention, which is good because they don't want to change their drinking, right? It's part of their student life. They're not motivated to change. They come to get the beer and course credit uh, and or financial reward. So if you put all of the experimental student studies together, what do you get? Very consistent pattern and it's the exact same thing in anxiety as Colin and others have shown. If you ch um, succeed in getting a change in this bias, then <coughs> that was a good shot. <laughs> <laughs> if you succeed in uh, getting a change in the bias, you get a short-lived effect uh, in the behavior, but that behavior is like taste test or maybe drinking the next couple of days, but that's it. You can't expect a clinical effect if people are not motivated to change, but that's also not the purpose. The purpose is to establish a causality. And of course, there are the clinical trials. But all of the papers you've seen so far <coughs> in the clinical groups, uh, they test the efficacy as an addition to treatment as usual. And that's where there is consistent evidence of add-on effects, ranging from, say, 8.5% to 22%. These people are aware that they may receive an intervention, which is good because they want to change their behavior. And their goal is typically abstinence. If you're in a clinic, most clinics there's little choice, right? If your goal is not abstinent, come back when it is. Um, in the online RCTs, that's another strand. So these people are motivated. You saw the example for working memory training. We also did some CBM stuff online. Of course, you can't force them into an abstinence goal, so they choose their own goal. Guess what? Everyone wants to reduce their drinking, not to quit. And they're very successful. Everyone does reduce their drinking no matter whether they're in the real condition or placebo condition. So it's again a different pattern. There's only one published study so far by my group, but we have a paper in the pipeline, as has Matt Field, big samples, very similar outcomes. Everyone wins, everyone wins prizes. But it's not a specific effect. So in a way it's good, and it doesn't discourage us from doing online stuff, but we are missing something like in the clinical studies, the question is, what is it we're missing? Why do we get the differential effects? I think there's two possibilities. The one is the abstinence goal. Because in smoking, we did do one study purely online. And there we verified that people had actually made a quit attempt. And then, in the heavy smokers, we do get an effect of intentional retraining. It's in Health Psychology 2016. Um, but in general, I think this really is a good add-on to regular treatment where you work on the long-term motivation and then for a subgroup of people who are easily tempted by direct cues, it might help them. So that's our conclusion. As we argued in this problem, it's actually a symptom of a broader problem 
related to a redefinition by NIH of clinical trials to include basically every experiment. So, what the meta-analysis did was right from the changed clinical trials perspective. And by the time a lot of psychological scientists, experimental psychologists, brain researchers found out that suddenly all of their experiments aimed at causality were clinical trials, there was a big uproar. And the last news is that, in fact, last month the Congress stops the NIH from implementing the new clinical trials policy. So, hopefully, uh, we're back to this meaningful differentiation between clinical trials on the one hand and experiments to look at mechanisms on the other hand. And if you're interested in that, there's also a nice paper by Pascal Chiren on the general experimental medicine approach, where it's really different phases in the whole process of experimental medicine. So in conclusion, CBM appears to work in alcohol use disorders when people are motivated to change, but have problems in succeeding in change. This can be due to curiosity, as the Corinda study showed, or strong bias, strong impulsivity. It's another study. So there are moderators by which we can predict the eff efficacy. Uh, it doesn't work in binge drinkers who are not motivated to change. So a lot of people, including one of the studies I was involved with, said, well, if these students drink so much and they show a bias, let's just train them a little bit and uh, we'll get over it. It doesn't. It's not like that. I mean, if you would do a motivational intervention and then add it, it might work. But given these characteristics, it's not the most likely group for it to work. Um, most of the work I showed you was in alcohol, but as I mentioned in the beginning, we find the same biases also, for example, with cannabis, with smoking. There's much less work yet, but it's not very difficult to do the trials also for these other disorders. And of course, the question is, can we improve training? But first, I want to do a little comparison with medication, just to give you an idea of the uh, si effect size. This is the last meta-analysis of the current medication that I'm sure you're aware of, acamprosate and naltrexone, if you add it to uh, treatment. And the number needed to treat is 12. And if you convert the 8.5% difference in number to treat, hey, that's 12. So it's about the same effect as what you get when you add medication. It's not very big. However, as I mentioned, there are indications that when you get closer to detox, detox, you actually get a bigger effect. So it might be an underestimation. Uh, we also did some work with another medication, the GABA-B agonist baclofen. And I think this is also interesting from a more broad perspective, because there was a small study in alcohol use disorder patients in Germany without further treatment. And there it was shown that uh, adding, well, giving them high dose baclofen versus placebo had a positive effect. We had a larger study where we added it to regular treatment, no effect whatsoever. So, this is really an interesting difference because, as you saw, the CBM effects are really a useful add on to the regular clinical treatment where at least for a subgroup you prevent relapse, whereas the medication seems to mostly do its work in people who don't respond to psychosocial treatment. It's tentative, but I think that's an interesting perspective. So one of the trials we want to do next with this baclofen, given the overall pattern of result, is see if it might help those people who really don't respond to regular treatment. All right, so to end, I'll give you some next steps. Um, definitely the cognitive training is not the most exciting thing to do. Typically in the dependent patients, that's not really a problem because they are motivated to do something and they feel they can do something while doing the training. But especially if you go like, we did some work with adolescents. I mean, they, first of all, they really don't think they have a problem even when they're heavy drinking or smoking cannabis. And second, um, if they would have a problem, they definitely don't want to do something about it. 
So we thought if we put it into more game type format, maybe it will work. Well, we basically get disappointment effects. So at first they think it's appreciated more than the regular training, but then it looks like a game, but of course you systematically train, so the appreciation really goes down. Violated expectancies, whereas the regular condition looks boring, and it is boring, <coughs> so you get a stable appreciation <coughs> at a low level. Uh, it can be done better, there's nice work of Lazarov in a very playful visual search where the music stops if you look at the wrong thing, for example. So I think, you know, it's not like this doesn't work in general, but there is a general thing, um, which we also made uh, with a PhD student, former PhD student, Wouter Boendemaker, looking at the data, and that is that if you gamify stuff, you increase, if you're successful, you increase the motivation to do the training, right? But it doesn't mean you change the motivation to change the addictive behavior. So it's not the same thing. So still, I think a more therapeutic, motivational context around training is necessary, unless people are already motivated, like in the smokers who want to quit. Um, we also have this line of research where we now look at more personalized alternatives primarily. Of course, with the drinks, you can also put in their favorite drinks, pretty trivial. Um, but alternatives might be a good link also between the therapy, say the CBT part, and the training. And it came from smoking, because for alcohol, of course, you have this natural opponent category of non-alcoholic drinks. And once people are out of their uh, clinic, they'll be in a social event where there are drinks and then there's this choice. So it's relevant for every participant. But what about smoking? What is not smoking? It's a lot of things. And it's a lot of different things for different people. So here we basically linked it to the CBT part, so you can link it to alternative goals that people have. What are reasons to quit smoking? It might be sports for one person, seeing a partner or seeing grandchildren longer for the second person. Um, so you really put in different types of pictures. And of course you can do the same with the means. So how are you going to achieve this? If you get home stressed rather than smoking and drinking, what you're going to do? Again, it might be running shoes for one person, swimmers for the next, but gardening for the third. And we have some first proof principle results here and now looking at a bigger trial. Of course, personalizing learning parameters could be good, given this big spread in how much training people need. So it's of course also boring if you're already plateauing, but you still need to do training. Then we have some experimental work where we uh, try to do the training after memory reactivation. This is basically uh, something that's done successfully in trauma, where you get the trauma memory out and then if you interfere with reconsolidation that has beneficial effects. <coughs> Interesting early day works and we have a line of research where we add neurostimulation to the training. If you're interested look up then L so then you get like for example low current over the brain which also increases your working memory and gets your craving down. So here's an example of a more playful training. Uh, this is with an old friend from Barcelona, Paul Verschuren, and his lab, which is big in uh, neuro rehabilitation, mostly after stroke. And as you see, it has components of the approach and attention. People store the non-alcohol drinks, but it's more playful than the. And you can put different levels in and. So it's just one of the ways to uh, try to make things a little bit more playful, but still targeted. I mean, it's easy to make games which really go wrong. So a lot of people have come to me and say, oh yeah, I want to do attentional training and let's make it a shooter game. <laughs> <laughs> and we shoot all the bottles out of the air. <coughs> well, what are you doing? Training attention to alcohol. 
So there's a lot of stupid things you can do with gamification. <laughs> but I think if you get the original researchers involved, they'll probably see it and uh, it does hold some problems. So how could you apply this? This I think was a good question that Liana also asked me. Um, we have it online, but that's all in Dutch. And of course you also want local stimuli. So should you guys want to add this to treatment, there's different ways. One is do it yourselves. Uh, and then we do have a protocol how to shoot the stimuli. So that might be useful. And uh, another way could be through a collaboration. And then I would suggest with me and the Barcelona group to try out some of these more playful ways. So if you're interested in that, you can uh, of course just contact me and we'll talk further about it. So in conclusion, cognitive training can be of use in the treatment of addictions. On the one hand, we have this general ability training. I think it has promise, uh, especially in inpatient recovery and especially if you link it to the rest of treatment and also as a motivator of recovery. And then there's the cognitive bias modification, which has been shown now over and over again uh, as an add-on to addiction in the clinical trials. It's small, but it's about as big as the best medication that we have number needed to treat 12 and it might actually be better if we get closer to detox and uh, maybe better versions so of course there's room for improvement and further research. want to acknowledge collaborators so that's the Lindo clinic and crew before it and this reanalysis stuff I've done with Marilisa and Matt Field from Liverpool and then of course all of this is really teamwork Lots of former PhD students, current PhD students and postdocs, so that's lab and collaborations uh, within University of Amsterdam and Netherlands, but also a couple in Australia with uh, Colin in Perth and with people from uh, uh, UNSW and recently we also started with Monash and who knows in the future with you guys. So that's it. Time for questions, I guess. Um, just a question about gender, mm -hmm. particularly with all that fear. I was just thinking about women and men. Yeah, so um, it's actually something we have really gotten interested in, gender differences. I didn't have time to present that, but in the like, Curie activity, it's just big gender difference. And as I learned during my stay here, they find the same in animal research on sign trackers and gold trackers. So men are way more sign trackers and have stronger biases um, and women are more gold trackers. So that would actually also imply something for um, training, I guess. And there's also different... So the men are basically the cues are potent inducers, at least in most of them, of the appetitive responses. In women, um, of course, there's more variability. Women are just very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true, eh? that of course there's like the menstrual cycle influences, so basically we would need six times more women to study everything in more detail and then um, the internal cues appear to be more important um, but of course the reality is that in most addictions we have more like six times more men so it's really hard to do the work and get enough women in but it's definitely interesting and it's not like it doesn't work like the approach bias training we don't get interaction with gender so it's but it could be because basically what's happening is that it changes the dominant goal rather than takes away how distracted you are by the cue. So it could even work through different mechanisms. But clearly something uh, of interest. But we have a recent paper on cure activity which was accepted yesterday in Journal of European Journal of Neuroscience. And we had real heavy drinking students who wanted to change. Average audit was 19, so that's pretty close to clinical levels. 
the guys do exactly what you expect in the scanner. You show the alcohol pictures, you get nice ventral striatum, dorsal striatum activity to the alcohol compared to the non-alcohol. Um, ACC activation. Women, flatline. Did somebody put the plug out? But these alcohol cues, and it wasn't because they were beer cues, so we personalized the beer wine, etc. So it wasn't that silly a mistake, but mm. they're just not very cue reactive. Mm. Is anybody doing any specific work? Sorry, is anyone doing any specific work on that? Uh, uh, you know, about. Yeah, about so one of my postdocs. Yeah, <laughs> one one of the postdocs working with me uh, works both with animals and with humans, and uh, has picked up this uh, interest in these gender differences. And it, uh, I was talking with animal researchers at UNSW, and that's really uh, on the agenda. And it's also on the official NIDA agenda, so it's, they want to see how the brain disease is different from men and women, I guess. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Mark? Hi, I'm, I've got dozens, but unfortunately I'm supposed to be in clinic 15 minutes ago, so I'll make it just <laughs> one, stick to one. Sorry. Um, no, 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 it's fine. No, no, I'll, I'll happily say. Um, the, um, do you think it matters whether the um, deficits, see, you made this point at the beginning about, you know, are we getting people back to baseline? Is this a, an addiction effect or is this mm -hmm. pre-morbidity? you know, predisposing, you know, um, vulnerabilities to addiction. Do you think it matters? Well, it, it, it depends on for whom. So I think for the patient, if you see improvement, and that's where you want to focus on, of course. So that is clinically relevant. But I know I made the point because often people will say that this is a typical example of partial recovery, but we don't know. Then you need to pretest, which of course, typically you don't have. But, uh, sorry. No, I'm actually thinking in, in some cases you might you might make a case for the folk who pre-morbidly had this deficit would be, even be potentially more likely to benefit from this training. Well, that's what Warren Bickle's results show. Of course, we don't know to what extent the people with low working memory who profit most from the working memory training were the low because of pre-morbid or acquired deficit, but clearly it's a good indicator. Yeah. And for the working memory, so that's a real good indicator. For the biases, we don't have one, and so that's really high on the my research priority agenda, but also on the people uh, doing bias research over in Perth, for example, is get more reliable measures. Clearly it's a uh, top priority, because if you want to apply it, I mean, it's not like it's a, so that's also nice that we typically don't find any negative effects of the people who don't show bias, you just look like a f flat line. But the people who do have a bias, at a group level, we can say they change and that helps them to stay abstinent. So, you know, if you have a program of 10 weeks, 3 months, why not add some training if it at least, on average, will help about 10% uh, of your clientele to remain abstinent. Any more questions from the floor? We've got any online questions? Okay, um, thank you for such a fascinating journey from pure experimental to pure That's clinical practice. It's now expanding from right from detox to relapse and around the world. So congratulations and please join me in thanking Professor Weirs. Thank you.